let's learn how to control shaders with scripts in Unity. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can control the curvature of this road, which is made with shader graph, but with code. I also want to make a quick note here, even if this particular use case doesn't apply to you, when you're working with shaders and changing their values, I've come across this exact same problem and solution multiple times when wanting to change the values. So even if you're not interested in building an infinite runner or subway surfers type game, you will still be able to use this logic for so many different use cases when it comes to shaders. With that said, let's continue. This road bending effect is controlled by this curve shader that I made in a previous video, but in this video I'll be showing you how to actually take the values from the shader graph and turn them into functions so that the curvature will change automatically, much like the functionality in Subway Surfers. So let's take a look real quick at what we have. So I have these three materials that I've made that are being controlled by the curve shader for the road, the buses, and the walls. But uh, don't judge me for my very low fidelity on these, it's just a placeholder for now. But if I select all of these and play around with their values, you can see that all of the objects in our scene are affected. If you just wanted to have a set curvature in your game, you could change these values and call it a day. But if you want something a little more dynamic, you're going to want to take these values and change them throughout your game. Now, as you can see in the inspector, because I am able to modify these here and not just in the shader graph, these are already properties. Now, if you take nothing else away from this video, I want you to take away this. If you want to change the value of something in shader graph, but in code, that part has to be in a property and you need to have a reference. Looking at my shader currently, up in the top left side, you can see that I have four properties already in my shader. If you want to reference one of these values, you'll click on your property and over on the right hand side, Unity tells you what the reference is called for this particular property. Now, if you're confused, don't worry, let's do this together. So let's start off by deleting this right here. Uh, without going into too much depth with how the shader works, this X value right here changes the value of the bend from side to side. So all I need is a float value here. Now I can turn this float value into a property by right clicking and selecting convert to property and I can name it whatever I like. So I still like the name sideways strength so I'm going to keep that. And notice as I'm naming it over here on the right hand side, Whatever I name it, Unity creates a reference for it, starting with an underscore in front of it. So the naming is pretty intuitive, and this reference is what you'll be using in your code to change this value. So take that information, put a pin in it, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But that still leaves us with the question of, when do we change the value? So I'm going to do something similar to what we did for the procedural generation. So in the last video, we created invisible walls that the player passes through in order to generate the next level. We're gonna do the same thing here, but I'm going to create a new invisible wall on the prefab with a different tag on it so that when the player passes through here, it will essentially create a signal to change the curvature. I'm just going to duplicate what we already have for the other trigger and move it slightly behind the wall. So I've already created the tag, but I created a new tag named curve and I'm going to apply it to our new invisible wall. Now with this set up, we can add some logic around it. So jumping out of the prefab, I'm going to create a script for this logic and I'm going to put it on the player. Since I want this effect to happen when the player passes through the road's trigger, I really only have two options when it comes to the script. I can either put it on the player or I can put it on the road. Since the player will always be present in the game, I'm going to put it on him, which is our little ball. So I'm going to add a script to him and I'm going to name it Curve Changer. Jumping into Visual Studio, I'm going to show you the basic way that this is going to work and then we'll build on top of it and make it a lot more scalable. So if I want to change that curve value, I first need to access that material so that I can grab the value. So let's create a public material and we'll name this road. We can also create three more of these since that's all of the materials that I have right now. So we can create one for the bus and we can also create one for the walls. So real quick, let's uh, save and drag and drop those materials over. I also need to decide what I want that final value of the curve to be. 
So I'm just going to create an empty float variable here and name it target value to store that. Now I want to check for the trigger. So I can create an onTriggerEnter method and an if statement in there so that if the player collides with a trigger that is tagged curve, let's change the target value to a random value within a range. Now I need to pass that value to the reference that we found earlier. So all we're going to do is say road.setFloat and we're going to pass in our reference from our shader graph and then pass in what we want it to change to. This is where I'll change my target value variable and we can set it to random.range. I found that between negative 0.005 and positive 0.005 is pretty good. So that's what I'm going to put in there, but you can play around with these values as you like. Also, don't forget to add the F for float or it's going to throw you an error like it is for me here. And I'm going to add in a little debug statement here just to make sure that this is getting called. And uh, don't forget to check for spelling. I forgot an underscore here. It's really easy to do. And then we're just going to do this three times for each material. Now I'm going to save this and show you why this really isn't going to work for us. And you can see when I hit play, it is working. But do you see that little jump there? The transition is not smooth and we really don't have any control over it. That and what happens if we have 20 materials instead of just three? Let's tackle the materials problem first. Instead of having a variable for every material, let's delete these and turn it into an array so I can add and subtract materials as I please. Then I can create a for each loop and say for every material in this array, set its sideways strength float value to the target value. Now I can go back to Unity and drag and drop my materials into this array. Now to tackle the jumping problem, which is a bit more complicated. What's happening now is the function is getting called only on trigger. So it's getting called once and moving the float value to its final position. But what we really need is for Unity to gradually move from its current position to the target position. So if we know where we are and we know where we want to go, we can interpolate the rest. To do this, we're going to create a coroutine. Coroutines have this awesome ability to run every frame until a condition is met. So we're going to write a function that gradually changes the sideways strength from where we are now to where we want to go. And it will stop running when both values are the same. But first we need a couple of new variables. We need a variable for the current value and we need a variable for the amount of time we want this transition to take. I'm going to be naming this lerp time and I'll explain what lerp is in a second. Now let's create our coroutine. So I'm going to create an IE numerator and I'm going to call it change curve strength. I need a new variable to keep track of the elapsed time. And I'm going to cut my logic from earlier for the target value and paste it here because every time the coroutine starts, I want that target value to change, but I only want it to happen once. Now for the meat and potatoes. I'm going to say while the elapsed time is less than the lerp time, do something. Here's where the interpolation comes in. So for the current value, which will update every frame, I want this to lerp, which is linear interpolation. So I'm going to say current value is equal to mathf.lerp, pass in the current value, pass in the target value, and then the elapsed time over the lerp time. And this is going to give us that smooth bendy effect over a period of time. We also need to keep track of how much time is passing for this to work. So I'm going to say elapsed time plus or equals time dot delta time. Now we have our magic value, but we still need to apply this to our reference value for that effect to actually take place where you can see it. So let's take our for each loop from earlier and put it in here. We'll also want to change target value to current value here. Lastly, to close our coroutine, we need a yield statement. So I'm choosing yield return null. The next thing we wanna do is set up the next time that this coroutine is called for success. So outside of the brackets here, we're going to set current value equal to target value so that the next time this runs, those will be the exact same. And finally, we need to call it. Where our other logic used to be in on trigger enter, we're now going to call start coroutine and then change curve strength. Going back to Unity, let's make sure that we have something entered for lerp time. And now you can see that we get that nice effect. 
we're almost done, but it's not quite there. For instance, what happens if the coroutine is called again before it's finished with the first time? And what if we want to start the game with a certain curvature? Let's say we want a really long transition time, but we don't want the coroutine to get called if it passes through another trigger in the meantime. We can easily solve this by putting in a check. We can create a bool is complete, which we can initially set to true. When the coroutine is running, we can set is complete to false, and when it's complete, we can set it to true again. Then we can take this bool, and within the onTrigger method, we can say if is complete is true, then call the coroutine. Let's say you also wanted to change the curve value within the inspector. While this may reflect on the front end, if the current value isn't initialized on what the curve value is when the game starts, you'll get a weird jump effect, but only on your first transition. We can do something like we did earlier for our materials. This time, we can create a for each loop, but instead of setting the value, we'll get the value from our shader and set it as the current value on game start. The last thing you might want to do is private some of these variables. Keeping them all public is nice for testing, but it's good practice to private what you don't need. So I'm going to go through and change a bunch of these. And there you go. That's how you change shader values in code. Hope you enjoyed this video. Cheers.